Okay, so our first case to talk about is the YouTube case, and this was a really interesting and important case under the DMCA. And of course, uh, all of us are very familiar with, with YouTube today. Um, I remember the very beginnings of YouTube, and um, you know, it, w it was very difficult um, even 10 years ago to have the bandwidth to uh, upload a full video or to stream a full video. Just to show you the humble beginnings in a sense of YouTube, here's a clip of actually uh, the very first YouTube video that was uploaded by one of the original founders of YouTube. So here we are, one of the uh, elephants. Um, cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts, and that's that's cool. And that's pretty much all there is to say. So as you can see, we've uh, come a long way in terms of the content that's available on YouTube. So the the facts in the YouTube case, and you know, this reflects uh, obviously a bit of of the the way the system worked um, six or seven or eight years ago when these facts were being developed. I think much of it is probably uh, still very similar today. But um, you upload a video to YouTube, like I'm going to upload this class video for you. You're agreeing to a terms of service. The terms of service includes um, a copyright provision. Uh, when you upload the video to YouTube, um, YouTube has software that's uh, copying and converting the video you upload into a format that's going to enable it uh, to be streamed. I'm not sure if, if they use Flash anymore. Uh, maybe they still do. I'm not sure. Um, and then when you go on YouTube, uh, YouTube is going to use algorithms to recommend related videos uh, to you that based on your, your past search his history or viewing history or, or so on. Um, at the time of the case, there was some expert testimony and a, a survey done that showed uh, that three quarters or more of all the content on YouTube contained copyrighted material. Now this sounds, uh, sounds pretty bad. It's not necessarily bad if we remember um, our understanding of how copyright law works and in particular how fair use works. In uh, the last video for this unit, when we talk about the Breitbart case, I'm going to show you the picture of Tom Brady that was at issue in that case. Well, that's copyrighted content. So my video will contain copyrighted content, but I'm, you know, 99.5% certain that what I'm showing you, even more than that, I'm 100% certain that what I'm going to show you is fair use. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean there's infringement, but nevertheless, it, it was the evidence of, of possible problems that were brought before the court. One of the really interesting things about the case factually is to look at the original history of the formation and founding of YouTube and uh, some of the kind of smoking gun documents from uh, the guy who uploaded that elephant video and some other things, really indicating that they knew that people were using the platform to post infringing content and that, in fact, they expected to make money off, off of people posting infringing, infringing content. So in terms of the legal analysis, we're looking at the DMCA safe harbor in Section 512C. So we've, we've talked a little bit already about the notice and, and takedown provisions of 512C, and um, that is a key piece of how you obtain the safe harbor. You have to have uh, a notice and, and takedown provision, but there are some other requirements under the statute as well. That first bullet there, the the uh, platform, the site, has to not have actual knowledge or what is called red flag knowledge, that is not be aware of facts or circumstances from which infringing activity is apparent. So if you have a notice and takedown provision, but you have actual knowledge that there is in fact infringing content on your site, you don't have the benefit of the safe harbor. If you have a notice and takedown provision and you have red flag knowledge, you don't have a safe harbor. This is really the, one of the big uh, catches with this YouTube site, uh, YouTube case, because the claim is, and the ongoing claim is, well, of course they know um, that there's infringing content, or of course they have reason to believe that there's infringing content. So how could they ever have a safe harbor? Um, that's one of the difficult things for a, for a case like this, because you could either have this statute simply immunize 
all of these sites notwithstanding what the statute says, depending on how you interpret it, or you could have the statute be basically worthless depending on how you interpret it. Um, a policy for terminating repeat infringers, um, not undermining technological protection measures, that is measures that the um, original owner of the content might have uh, placed into the content like a digital watermark or something like that. And then the second bullet is also relevant in this case, unable to control what customers post or not receive a direct financial benefit from the posting. So this is another bit of a, a kind of um, you know catch-22 for some of these sites because the more control that the site exerts over what users can post, um, the more difficult it is to assert that you have a safe harbor. Where, and the statute is really designed for a site to say, hey, I'm just a platform. I, I don't control what anybody posts. Um, I don't know that there's anything infringing, but I don't control it. So you see how you know, some of these uh, elements of, of the statute, even though it's a statute created for the Internet age, already by the time of this YouTube case are kind of getting eclipsed um, by the technology and by the way people are using the sites. Now, whenever I think of, of all this, I, I think of my, my favorite movie, Casablanca, and one of my favorite scenes uh, from the movie Casablanca. Um, so uh, here's the scene from the movie, but think of it in these terms. I'm shocked, shocked to find out that there's infringement going on here. Laszlo's presence in the cafe can inspire this unfortunate demonstration. What more will his presence in Casablanca bring on? I advise that this place be shut up at once. But everybody's having such a good time. Yes, much too good a time. The place is to be closed. But I've no excuse to close it. Find one. Sorry, monsieur. Sorry. Everybody is to leave here immediately. This cafe is closed until further notice. Clear the room at once. Oh. Oh. Close me up on what ground? I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody out at once. So how does the court address these various issues? Uh, in the end of it, really, the court punts, punts them back for fact-finding. So on actual knowledge, you know, the court recognizes this difficulty that to some extent, that the fact that you even have a notice and takedown policy seems to suggest that you have knowledge that there is or that there may be infringing content on your site. So if you're going to interpret it that broadly, you're, you're kind of doing away with the statute. But if you're going to interpret, interpret it really generously to the owner of the site, then um, you're almost immunizing them. So here the court says, issues of fact, this has to go back to the fact finder. There were, of course, particular things in the record, those particular emails where it was clear that um, YouTube knew there was infringing content, and that was one of the issues here. The willful blindness question um, arises from a common law doctrine that says that um, if you purposefully close your eyes to wrongful conduct, if you take steps that, that's in, in insulating you from seeing or knowing that the wrongful conduct is happening, and you're doing that to try and avoid liability for the wrongful conduct, then the knowledge is going to be imputed to you, and you're going to be liable for the wrongful conduct anyway. So you can't just kind of close your eyes to it when you know or should know otherwise that, it, that it's going on. Um, and again, the court sees this doctrine as kind of a, a difficulty. What does the DMCA do with this? Does it adopt the willful blindness doctrine wholesale? Does it modify it in some way? Um, and this court says, well, it, it can't simply adopt it wholesale because if it adopts it wholesale, then effectively what it's doing is it's putting on the owner of the platform an affirmative duty to monitor for infringing content. Here, I think, is where one of the big uh, fights lies in a case like YouTube and also, as we'll see in a little bit, in the European uh, uh, copyright directive. You have um, big producers of content, a Viacom, a Universal Studios, a Paramount, a Fox, um, and you have big providers of service, uh, streaming services, Google and YouTube. Um, and who is gonna bear the cost 
of monitoring the site to see whether there's infringing content on the site. The content providers would like to shift that cost over to the platform providers. The platform providers would like to keep that cost with the content providers. That's the, the business background to um, a lot of what this willful blindness fight is. And once again, the court says, issue of fact, punting it back to the trial court. Similar kind of issue arises in this right and ability to control uh, provision. What does it mean? Does it mean that you have specific knowledge that there's already infringing content and you could remove that specific infringing content? If so, that would really make this section redundant to the actual knowledge or red flag knowledge provision. Um, does it mean the same thing as a common law uh, or copyright law vicarious liability claim? Well, that would be really broad. That would put a really broad duty on the content provider um, to adopt technologies to screen and, and control. So again, the, in the case, the statute isn't quite caught up with uh, already with how things operate, and the question is who's going to bear the cost of adapt, uh, adopting and developing screening technology. Um, so here, once again, uh, the, the, the case goes back for fact-finding. So what happens when the case goes back for fact-finding? The district court, after uh, developing the facts, finds that there's no liability for YouTube under the facts. Of course, that's not the end of the case because there's still the possibility of appeals, but at this point, the parties settle. Now, uh, there's nothing about this in the, in the reading I gave you, but I want to give you some things from, from uh, press clippings at the time about this settlement, and I think it puts a little bit more kind of business context around what's going on in, in the legal fight. Um, so Viacom issues this statement saying, you know, this is about collaboration. We um, actually realize that this YouTube platform is very valuable for our brand and for our content. We want to fi find ways to work together with YouTube so that we can have a broader audience for um, our content. As part of it, as part of the settlement, now that the, the precise terms of the settlement were confidential, but there was some reporting on, on some of the things that happened, and Google did in fact adopt a filtering technology. So at least some of that cost that the content producers wanted to shift onto the platform providers they did shift onto the platform providers um, as a result of this settlement and as a result of, of kind of, you know, other business developments, other market developments. So now, um, as you probably know, if you uh, post content to YouTube, there are algorithms in the background that are, uh, that are doing this, this kind, of, kind of monitoring. At the same time, and this is, again, notice the date of this. This is 2012. It's already, you know, six years old. But at that time, Viacom said, yeah, we're doing this, but, you know, uh, we're, we're not really looking to, to, to use YouTube in a major way. What we, in fact, want to do is um, develop our own platforms. Um, and it may be that we develop those platforms with, um, you know, cable providers, cable television providers, um, or other providers of, of paid television. You know, we could have the Viacom channel as part of a, a cable arrangement. Um, and, and as you probably know, that didn't exactly happen. I mean, there's no, as far as I'm aware, at least my cable provider doesn't have a Viacom channel. What was this all about? And I talk about this quite a bit more in the new media law class. The fight in the, uh, uh, of the business is over who controls how you see the content, who controls the platform. I could say it this way, because all of this, you know, whether you're using cable uh, television, whether you're using a streaming service, whether you're using YouTube, it's all coming over the hardware layer of the internet. So we could say that this is about the control of the content layer of the internet. Um, having control of that gateway, of that content layer, of how you get the content um, is extremely valuable. And that's where, um, that's where the big fight is, both as a legal matter under statutes like this, uh, under the European Copyright Directive, and as a business matter. So, you know, what happened in the interim? Well, one of the things that happens in the interim is Netflix. Netflix develops into um, this ubiquitous big streaming service, and it becomes one of the platforms of choice. Um, and then 
as as kind of a rival to it, Amazon develops, and then as kind of a rival to those um, platforms like like Hulu Hulu develop. You also see today, although there isn't a, Vi a Viacom channel uh, through your cable provider, all of the channels that exist, um, as well as other content providers, have apps, um, and so you can stream at least some of the content through apps, and then use a device like like Google Play or Roku Stick or something like that to watch them. Those fights are still going on. Um, there's a host of other law, other copyright law. Um, the Aereo case that that went to the Supreme Court on um, cloud-based DVR services. We look at some of those things in the new media law case. This is one piece. This YouTube case is one piece of a big fight over the convergence um, of um, content with different kinds of media platforms. I want to show you a couple other things about the notice and, and takedown um, provision under the, under the DMCA, the safe the safe harbor. Um, I'll just show you a little video from Google about how they understand it and, and how it works, and um, show you a, a clip from uh, YouTube's DMCA page. So. Uh, you see kind of how it looks. You, you, you're probably aware of this if you use YouTube, but see how they um, portray their, their DMCA obligation. Every day, millions of people around the world post content to Google platforms. Things like videos on YouTube, blog posts on Blogger, and social media posts on Google+. Occasionally, people are concerned about the content they see on our platforms. Some people tell us they've seen content that they think violates the law. Others think they found something that is against our content policies. You know, the rules for our communities. We want people to tell us when they see content that may violate our policies. This can include bullying, hate speech, graphic violence, or sexually explicit content. On many Google products, there's a way to let us know about these kinds of violations. Google takes these reports seriously. When deciding whether something is against our policies, we review complaints on a case-by-case -case basis. If it's determined that the flagged content violates our guidelines, we take it down. Repeat offenders often face penalties. For instance, on YouTube, users may have some of their account privileges revoked for a while. Too many strikes, and the account is disabled. In addition to responding to community concerns, we want to make sure the content on our platforms is legal. In many cases, the best way to address a legal issue is to reach out to the person who uploaded the content. Often, they'll remove or modify it on your request. But sometimes, that won't work. In that case, we've got a web page that will route your complaint to the right team at Google. When considering a legal notice, we carefully assess the information provided. For all legal matters, it's important to properly name the content, specify the law allegedly being violated, and why you have the right to get this content removed. Without this information, we may be unable to understand or process your legal claim. We work hard to respond fairly and accurately to legal and community concerns. That's how we maintain vibrant communities, while staying true to our commitment to free expression. Now, just coming back to this, I mean, it all seems pretty benign when you see that, that Google video, and, and, and perhaps it is. Some really interesting st statistics, and this comes from a site called Torrent Freak, which, based on the name, you can tell is kind of uh, frequented by people who use, um, you know, uh, torrent files, which is a, a common way to share illegal content. Um, in 2016, Google received 75, and this is based on Google's own data, 75 million DMCA notices. Uh, if you break that down by day, it's almost two and a half million notices a day. If you break that down by hour, it's about 100,000 notices per hour. Um, so that's an extraordinary role that Google plays in screening, determining uh, what is even possible to be seen or not on the internet. It's an extraordinary role, I would say, that Google plays in the governance of the content layer. You remember, um, the, the takedown notice 
is, is simply a claim. It's not adjudicated yet. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily fully take into account uh, defenses like, like fair use, even though uh, under some case law it's supposed to. Uh, it, it, it gives a tremendous role and responsibility to the platform provider like a Google to decide what's going to be seen or not. And that's a, also a big question uh, of Internet governance that a lot of critics of the DMCA point to. Um, very interesting is I just, as I was preparing this, this video, I kind of looked up uh, this data on Torrent Freak again, and um, it appears that the total number of takedowns has decreased, but part of, with, with Google, has decreased, but part of that could be that Google is now taking more prophylactic steps to not even index things, and if it's not indexed, it's not going to be found through search, uh, that Google believes could contain copyrighted content. And one of the ways in which they're doing that uh, is algorithmic. So they're developing algorithms, uh, and when you hear algorithms, right, we should be thinking um, artificial intelligence. So Google is developing AI, which is becoming more and more sophisticated, uh, and which is pre-screening uh, things that are going to be indexed or not indexed through Google search, which means they're going to be effectively, they're going to be available or not available within the Internet's content layer. And I think this is a really interesting development, and, and perhaps a you know perhaps a troubling development is AI really beginning to govern? Is an AI function beginning to govern the content layer of the internet? 